Claro, ¿no? ¿Qué tiempo? ¿Ya empezó? Everybody, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Masarika. I'm going to chair the session, and um, uh, uh, I want to give the status of chairman of the session. I really want to express my gratitude to uh, Carlos. Jose Carlos Gomez uh, Maranda has done tremendous work not only for this conference, but for this five years of GFOA that we enjoyed very, very much. So, Carlos, thank you for that. Sometimes I remind people that uh, before COVID, uh, this initiative was really uh, kind of exceptional. And so now, of course, everybody takes it for granted that uh, we did online talks, but at the time, especially. Okay, having said that, uh, I will share this uh, morning session. And I'm uh, very happy to introduce uh, Professor Berger from Exeter University and he will give a talk on continuous topological measures, university winding, and higher order winding. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this beautiful city. Um, yes, I want to talk about um, topological measures where you don't have closed curves. So you uh, have a magnetic cloud coming erupting from the sun and has. If you have uh, a magnetic cloud erupting from the sun, it has endpoints or foot points in the surface of the sun. So we have to deal with that. Um, um, so with the sun, the sun is more or less spherical. So a very high approximation, and that makes life easy. Um, if there are several methods of dealing with topology above a plane or between parallel planes, or above a sphere or inside a sphere, between, um, and they, they all tend to agree with each other, and everybody's happy. It's but when you get away from all that symmetry. Uh, things get more complicated. 
that's what I want to talk about today. So I'll give a little bit of introduction uh, just to set the scene and then and then get into a topic uh, which I've been doing recently, which is putting blinding numbers in time, some arbitrary, say simply connect by uh, where where the curves have endpoints on better. So Oh, okay. So, um, Um, so, you're familiar with the Gauss linking integral, and if uh, most of my talk will not be magnetic fields, uh, about 10 minutes in the middle, I might be doing magnetic fields. But uh, to consider having the tangent vector super dx2 sigma and so on, substitute in the magnetic field vector and get much the same thing, integrate over a volume. And, uh, so it reaches those to get the linking numbers times flex squared, uh, whatever configuration F B. Um, if you like to simplify the magnetic integral, you can do one of the integrations using Coulomb gauge that gives you something called a vector potential, and then you get we'll see in the common form called a dot b. Uh, the problem with that is a, they're, they're, the inverse curl is generally not unique uh, and that can cause confusion sometimes. So the uh, integral, the double integral is actually more useful. Um, so, what happens when you apply the Gauss double integral to just one curve? It's no longer in variant of those curves, but you get the rod. And I have a couple examples to show. Here you have three tubes with helicity of one. And you can either have a twist of one, twist around the central axis, and rod zero, or uh, the second middle. Thing has arrived at this 0 0.05 less than 0 0.375. Here's another example where you have a uh, linking member. Um, so the ride is identical because the ride just depends on the shape of the axis group. The, so on the left, the twist is highly negative. You wrap your left hand in the direction. Of the uh, twisting field lines and your thumb in the direction of the axis. Um, and you end up with each of those field lines linking the central axis by minus eight. You write, I put in a lot of positive twist, so it looks never to the same line. Uh, um, so, ride is related to the area above a tantric curve. It's known as the tangent tension indicatrix curve. So, you just take the tangent vector to your curve and you move it around and you just keep track of its direction on a sphere, on a unit sphere, and then you get the Oh. Ah. There it is. And, and then that gives you this tantric curve. And uh, there's some really nice theorems, which I will go into, about how this relates to the rod. So now I'll start getting into pieces of curves. What happens if you have two curves? 
but slice the curves with terrible planes. So then you get wild. Um, here, up to an integer, the winding number will just be the difference between the angle between the endpoints on the top and the angle on the bottom. Oh, it's useful in what I what follows to choose that an x axis and then measure angles from that x axis. And you have two angles, you take the difference. So you'll be there up to the back to this is we're going to modify the circuit for the side sort of simply connect to the line. Okay. Um, so it's just a function of the four boundary points. Uh, and so you, you can also sometimes speed up your numerical estimations of these things because you know uh, if you can get that function accurately of the boundary points, all you need to do is find the correct integer. Okay. Um, so, how do you find this function of boundaries? I'll show you in a moment where we use of the orbit term. So, if we have a set of, let's say, magnetic loops or whatever, or whatever you like that. Are stuck to a boundary, um, the helicity will change when the endpoints move their little to the surface. If the endpoints spin, that's your spin term. And then if the endpoints orbit each other, that's your orbit term. So the spin term adds to the twisting, and the orbit term gives you a sort of mutual line. And you can do it in terms of vector potentials. So, um, if for a set of n foot points you have this formula, the derivative of the velocity of the corona with respect to time is this double sum of the theta ij to the theta ij. Theta ij is the angular velocity of the foot point i by foot point j. If i equals j, then you get this with this spin term. Uh, measuring the twist. So now there's something neat about this formula. There's never leave home without your flux ropes. Um, okay, this formula knows whether I, if it's double I, it's the same endpoint of one flux two. If it's IJ, it's two different endpoints. But they could be on the same flex tube or on different flex tubes. And the, the formula doesn't know. Um, so, yeah, the formula. Yeah, the formula doesn't know about that. So, Um, and I'm going to use that in order to figure out these orbit terms because they'll help with the one. Thing. <coughs> so that works. Uh, with two arches, I'll get winding numbers this way. You look at each pair of endpoints and figure out its angle. Uh, in the end, you need interior angles. So let me explain where this formula comes from. Let's say you already have one arch here. Okay. Now, a second arch is going to come along. It's just going to sort of come here and come out. Okay. When it first appears, it says two points next to each other. Okay, call it a dipole, let's say. 
And there's still zero velocity, zero winding, zero arbitrage. And then as it rises, the two endpoints move apart. The two, okay, so um, if, say, we have the blue foot points start out, say the minus foot point starts out here and then moves up to its final position. As it moves, these angles change. So we need to know the change of the angles as the point moves, and that gives you this winding. Going through all this with the plane, which is a simple distance, then we're going to have to do uh, plenty, plenty shape of form. So, um, now, the other funny thing here is there are four pairs of foot points. And you have to worry about the angles of all four of those, say, with respect to some arbitrary excesses. And that's a little bit funny because back here, I only seem to have two pairs. So what's going on there? Up on the bottom blue point does not interact with the top red point. How come I can do that? So that's a fun thing. So we'll try to explain that. Um, and I'll say also that self and mutual felicity uh, are separately conserved between parallel planes. So here I have two flux tubes. They're twisted and rived, but if, if I took the yellow away from one array, the blue twist plus rive is an invariant. And then there's the mutual felicity between the blue and. But funny thing happens when you get uh, here two flux tubes or two curves between concentric spheres. So one of these weird homology lines are uh, volumes. So what happens there, I think this is called the Dirac world trick. Uh, I should have made these uh, tubes better, so you can see better. But in the, at the left, the blue one is on top, but the, the red one. And then you move the blue one all the way around the sphere, and then it, on the right, it's now behind. So you turn what was once positive, uh, a positive crossing now looks like a negative crossing. Uh, so this mutual velocity seems to have uh, been lost, but does that mean velocity is not conserved? Well, no. Because when you do this, the end state has a lot of twist uh, that compensates for the loss in the chips. So if you go here, if you look closely at that blue uh, row on the right hand side, you find it has acquired some twist. Uh, I'm going to mention a little bit about vector potentials on the sphere. Uh, just because it brings us to something I, I was really excited about. My favorite theorem as a student, it's, it's really good to have favorite theorems to super fun. <laughs> My favorite theorem as a student is Gauss Bodet. Here we can use Gauss. Later on in the talk, we'll find Gaussian A is good enough. But right now, it's just brilliant because uh, if you have vector potential on the sphere, it depends on theta, the co-latitude away from the top of the sphere. Uh, it, it, um, and let's say the point one is, is uh, at the north pole. Back there. Um, then the velocity flux, let's say this 
was going to rotate around. So this flux rope rotates around, um, but without, as a solid body rotation, without, without twisting. Um, then the elicit flux should be zero, it's not twisting. That means that you have spin turns, it's spinning at the North Pole, it's spinning uh, at that latitude, which might be around the latitude, when you're done with that. Um, and um, so the orbit term has to compensate for the two spin terms. And it does, so that it cancels out the spin terms. Um, now, so since this, if the sun were a flat plane, then if you went around in a circle, the tangent vector would orbit by 2 pi, but it's not. Uh, orbiting, there's something called the geodesic deviation, the angle deficit. Uh, and so, like, if it, 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 it went around the equator, there, there would be zero, um, zero angle and the geodesic deviation. So, that means, according to the gauss Bonnet theorem, the curvature closed is one minus geodesic. Okay, so how do we use that? Um, when calculating the influence of a single point, good point, we need to have a return flux. And according to this, the return flux would be distributed according to Gauss curvature. I no longer believe this, but it, it works with the sphere, it works for the pilot symmetric. So we'll see why it might not work in a few minutes. So basically, for the sphere at least, when it goes around, it's, it's, it's not going around the entire flux of that north pole. It's also orbiting some return flux that returns to the orbit of the So now we'll make a complication of the winding numbers inside the cubes. Uh, so we're going to try to figure out what happens when you have two points in different surfaces, maybe one of the point and the bottom one of the sides. So one way of doing this is what I just did with the sphere. Have something where we agree that you are not going to change the diversity of the object. You're not going to be twisting it up. Uh, and I've drawn this so that the central axis is in a plane. So I'm going to sort of make a ansatz or a definition that if your curve is stays in the plane, then it has zero y. Try to redefine y. Inside some kind of body. And maybe, uh, I think my definitions are consistent with the idea that you have two curves that stay in the same plane, then they are not one to each. So, right now, whoops. I'll turn this thing. There, you go. there should be spin terms now cancel each other because the unit normal vector is pointing. Well, let's say it's a flux suit where the field lines go from the bottom to the top. B dot n hat is positive at the bottom and negative at the top. So the spin term is cancelled. So that means the orbit term must should be zero. 
Uh, so you get a zero orbit term, and that explains what I said uh, a long time ago that you have. You don't care about the, the bottom blue endpoints interacting with the top red endpoints. Okay. What about one foot point on the side? Okay, so yeah. So the bottom foot point is spinning, but the top, the side one is not spinning. So the orbiture should be half of what it be, would be on the bottom of okay. So that's what I'm expecting. Um, however, just to confuse the issue, we could go back to this council for name business. Or we could Try to find a good vector potential on the surface of the, uh, of, of the Q. So we have three different ways of doing it. What I've just said geometrically, uh, we'll try the Gauss Bonnet and we'll try uh, finding a cute, nice vector potential for, for the sphere. Uh, there is a nice vector potential. Uh, it's where you have zero divergence of A, and secondly, uh, uh, the vector potential stays within uh, the, the, the vector potential confined to the, to the boundary is parallel to the boundary. It's called foiloid. And you could, there might be some animal, weird analytic way of doing this, but you, you can. Do this numerically pretty simply uh, and find it. So that's method number one. Method number, or actually method number two, I gave you method with those uh, plus students. Method number three is what I said with Gauss Binet. I'm going to put all of the return flux at the four at the eight corners. So one eighth return flux or when I'm looking at the effects of a foot point. Okay, I should say when I use method number two to use uh, vector potential, I need to put the return flux somewhere. So what I'll do is, if say the foot point is here and I'm evaluating over here, I'll put the return flux right at the evaluation point. Now the vector potential will go crazier at that evaluation point. So there's all this magnetic flux there, it'll form circles around the center of the evaluation point. Uh, so if we average over a small area around the evaluation point, the effect of the, the effect of the return flux will vanish. It'll just Get the influence of the original foot point. Okay. And then weird happens. This figure here, I made it too, a little too opaque. The, about the flux tube we're worried about, the influence of the flux tube we're worried about is down here. On the bottom plane near the near the side. Okay. Um, and this, these are the directions of the orbit term of vector potential, if you like. Um, and this works for the this foil field where you put the uh, return flux of the evaluation point. It also is exactly the same. As where you use Gauss Bonnet and you put the return flux at the eight corners that, that they match up to uh, any kind of numerical error. Uh, 
And so, so of course they do weird things. They, they sort of orbit a bit around their corners. So that's surprising. I, I expected a, uh, something like this for the gauss bonnet but I didn't expect it for doing this funny thing and putting three turn flux at the evaluation point, that, which is numerically terrible because you have to re, uh, you have to make a new solution every time you move the evaluation point. Making new solutions is numerically very, very slow. Um, this is the geometric bit where you just, uh, Take the angle between your evaluation points and your foot point that, that you're worried about, and you multiply by one half on the side, you multiply by zero on the top. Um, so I suspect this is the one that works. Um, and I'm a little bit puzzled about why it works. I'm guessing, let me see. Okay, so this um, this wall is coming in not at a ninety degree angle. Okay, so let's say um, if I take a path from the bottom of this wall and then come up uh, vertically. If you look at the tangent vector uh, of that path, it actually turns a little bit. It would be better to pick out a wall coming at a very sharp angle. That tangent vector wants to keep on going in that direction. But if, if you're in a plane that hits this plane, that your curve goes down along a little bit of the floor and then straight up. Um, so the tangent vector is making a turn, but if you have a flux tube coming upwards, it's not turning. There's some difference between uh, how a flux tube behaves as it moves, say, from the floor upwards if you're at a funny angle um, than what the tangent. That's what I think is happening. Okay. Okay, so we can do this for spheres. We could uh, do it for more general surfaces. So here I'm, I'm just trying to see how much uh, if we take your flux rope and rotate it, uh, how much has it how much does it rotate on that um, uh, the main, uh, on the new um, plane? Okay. So that gives you something of the orbit term locally, and then you have a surface which is curved to just integrate the results from things. So uh, this is going to mention. Uh, okay, so not a, a, a dot at the University of New Hampshire uh, is uh, works with observations of the solar wind that got me doing all this stuff. She had a numerical simulation of a magnetic cloud, and the numerical simulation was in a sort of volume that, that like what you see there, sort of shape of the full attached solar system set. And um, so you you can divide the magnetic field into different regions separated um, by subradrices, and then figure out helicity and flux and lightning between mutual helicity and drive and so on. 
um, using some of these tools. So, I mean, so I want to spend a few minutes talking about higher order winding and whether there are uh, continuous alternatives to the sort of uh, higher order linking networks that I might use for quarrel gain breaks. So you could use these for my quarrel gain breaks. So, um, I'm not sure this is uh, we can think of braids as space time diagrams of motion in 2D. Uh, so if these three points were to move around that figure H uh, and take their space time diagram of time is upwards, you'll get a uh, pigtail braid. Uh, and one thing we can do is put, it's useful, I think, to put those three points in the complex plane, and we can figure out the net winding angles between the moving points according to these formulas. So the real part of it would be a lot more than this, or um, sort of a lambda, the real part of this would be the, the winding number between two, two, between one side and chain. Uh, and I should say there are probably a lot of you guys know a lot more than I, but uh, that are useful for one mesh of dynamical systems, holes in the magnetized fluid, point vortices, choreographies, mixing the bodies. This is an old slide, so forgive me for not having some use. So now, if we have, say, four points, or three or four points, we can create cross ratios. Um, and the neat things are that these cross ratios are functions of each other. So, for example, dv wedge du would be equals zero. Okay. And that's nice because that can lead to some invariance. So uh, we can get a second order invariance uh, log v d log u. That would be zero. So you, you would get just the ordinary first order lining number from just log v. Control log B to log U, second order invariant. And similarly, you can get third order okay. uh, We can do this if, if we only have three points, three first, we can send the fourth point off to infinity. Get out of here for infinity, and uh, then you get. Your terms. Okay. And let's say we do something funny where you measure the three angles on Cartesian planes, which is a sort of weird thing to do. So, what looks like the x axis might be theta AD, y axis theta AC, theta BC. And of course, you can wind more than once, so you can go up to then you come into space. Now, the higher order variants don't care about any uniform twist of all three points. So the uniform twist is where all three angles increase together, so that's sort of in, in one of these directions, perpendicular uh, sort of yeah. At angle to all of the three axes. Uh, so perpendicular to this invariant direction of uniform rotation is this funny shaped thing with the hexagons and the triangles. 
the hexagons are holes, they're forbidden regions. Okay, so I mean, the sum of the angles has to add up to 183 to 5. So there, there are certain combinations of angles which are forbidden, and that, that those are the holes. Just don't go with the holes. And so you fit on four king ring. Um, the, 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 this particular pigtail braid gives you the, the that blue curve I there. It encircles one of the holes. So that is one way of proving that the world mean rings are not um, cannot be. Um, a uh, straight down. Um, so with uniform uniform forces here, uniform twist, you're not going to get anything. So um, on the left, you're just not going anywhere in the space. You're just going to stick to that plane of spots. Uh, just have something that is very complicated, then just goes into like an essentially straight line. Doesn't take a circle with your tail solutions like this, and you can get other solutions. Okay, so just wanted to mention that. Um, Sort of worked out with three and four. I don't know what to do when you go higher than four because unless there's some analog of cost ratios that works for more than four points. Um, but, uh, so, uh, this is what I got for the four point motion. The way I generated these was to use a Hamiltonian. Um, so if I move around points in the complex plane, I can have an analytic function and then take the H to be the Hamiltonian to be measured part, and then you get these Hamilton's equations. And the motion is the direction of increasing the real part of the analytic function. So your Hamiltonian uh, maximizes winding number. This funny thing here. Really fun. And uh, uh, the only thing I should say, it, it's fun to work with, but when I did this and tried to generate these guys, they do tend to crash into each other. You have to choose special initial conditions so they don't crash into each other. Maybe there's something they can add to to protect that. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. Any questions? From the audience, please. So, you were speaking about um, this kind of lattice that was generated by um, the allowed kind of movements of between the brains. Is it this? Yes, that kind of lattice. Yeah. Yeah. I would presume that uh, you mentioned that this kind of arrangement is because of the limitations, the act, the act. Yes. Right? So that have that, um, yeah. If we presume or that the endpoints, instead of just planes, we have so many other you know, kind of manifold with more complicated right. curvature, we will presume that then we could have some sort of more interesting lattice. Probably, yes, yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah. We perhaps, as we could, like, right now we don't have the triangle for your love mm -hmm. of So, in theory, you could improve such space and manifold, how free they are to interfund with each other. Yeah, you might be able to. Explore was forbidden regions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
some bitch. Uh, yes, yes. Sorry. Uh, so linking us, uh, winding us to something uh, to is related to link. Yeah. Are these uh, theta invariants or the lambda invariants related to high order high order taking like the number of these invariants? I think so. I mean, I started out working on it using Shen's iterated integral. But there's another guy, Ito, who did uh, Ito's calculus. I wish he had done it, because then it would be Ito's iterated integral. But anyhow, Shen. <laughs> Shen's iterated integrals, which relate to, I believe, to more and more numbers. Go to infinity somehow. Explanation or something you get, like some of the uh, invariants, not invariants, are not polynomials. Other questions? I just have to actually, yeah, you mentioned the fact that you, you consider two concentric spheres. But then linking numbers are no longer uh, served. Is that correct? Yeah. Is it due to the fact that you're dealing with basically a multiple connected peak? Yes. And yes. But then, especially those two, uh, the evidence for those uh, interested in computations, this you have to correct the formula of this For example, Dagger and Baldwin, you know, goes the correction. That's right. Is that correct? Yes, this is a different kind of multiple connectedness than inside a torus. So, so they're correcting, if you have to inside a torus, you worry about flux coming through the hole, you have to correct for that. So, we need some technique techniques to take care. Yes, that's right. No further questions. Let's uh, thank the speaker again. <laughs>